Good morning and welcome to this MacFest webinar, which will be presented today by Carl Ryder, the University of Leicester, and Tom Jones from the Merlin Group. My name is Bob Willis, and I'll be organizing today's session. Before we start talking about our subject of today, surface finishes, I'd first like to introduce you uh, to the control panel, which you have on your screen at this moment in time. Now, to open and close the control panel, thus not obscuring your view of the slides during the presentation, you can click the orange button. You can go full screen on your projection facility in your conference room or on your screen by clicking on the blue button. Now, if you want to ask a question about one of the presentations or a particular point during the presentation, then all you need to do is click directly onto the control panel and type your question into the control panel as indicated here by the red arrow. Now, these questions will be answered by the presenters at the end of the webinar, so at the end of both presentations. But please take a moment to type your question at any time during the webinar and those questions will be answered at the end of the session uh, this morning. Now, if you have any technical problems, please use one of the telephone numbers provided on your registration reminder emails. You'll also need your webinar ID number and access code, which was included on your emails. It's not possible for either of the presenters or myself to assist you during a live presentation. At the end of the presentation, we have a couple of survey questions on the event, its content, etc. And you'll be able to obtain a copy of both of the presentations after the webinar by visiting the MacFest website, or you'll receive an email for the presentation. In addition, a copy of the video recording will also be available from the MacFest uh, website. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to our first presenter on this webinar this morning. And I'd like to now hand over control and slides uh, to Carl, who will give his first presentation. Good afternoon. Sorry. Good morning to you, Carl. Uh, hopefully the weather's fine where you are uh, in Leicester. Uh, good, good morning, Bob. <laughs> um, it's fine in Leicester. It's, uh, the weather is always good in Leicester. Um, can you hear me okay? Is, is everything technically working? Everything is technically working and your voice is very, very clear. So I'll leave it in your capable hands. Please carry on. Perfect. Um, so welcome to those of you who are, are, are remote. Um, I'll uh, spend the next few minutes just introducing uh, the, the topic of electrolytic nickel immersion palladium immersion uh, gold from Deep Eutectics. Um, so I'll give you some background information about the, um, the motivation for our project and our studies. Um, I'll give you some, uh, some background to the, the technology and then explain some of the most important and hopefully relevant results. And then um, my colleague Tom Jones from Merlin uh, will then go, uh, follow that up and present some data, uh, test data that um, uh, Bob has acquired for us and, and uh, other test data to hopefully um, show you that um, some of the technical equivalents of the finishes that we've been developing. I should also mention my colleague here who's with me uh, in Leicester, Dr. Andy Ballantyne, and Andy is the one who's uh, done most of the, uh, the, the lab work on these. Okay, so I shall... Uh, move on to the next slide. So this is really a list of the uh, material that I want to cover in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, I'll talk a little bit about ionic liquids and, and deep eutectic solvents. So these are the, the, the solvent media from which we're um, developing these types of new surface finishes. Um, I'll explain how um, these have, we've developed these in the context of, of immersion and uh, particularly immersion coatings uh, for electronic finishes. So I'll talk a little bit about immersion silver, um, a little bit about uh, ENIG. Um, some work which we developed uh, on a slightly different tack in, in terms of looking at alternative solar fluxes, um, and I'll, I'll mention uh, that in, in passing. And then obviously um, talk about the, the MACFEST work, which is the main focus of this work. And I should just uh, point out that the, the acronym then is, is, is associated with the Manufacturing of Advanced Coatings. 
uh, with an eye on, on future systems. Okay, um, so ionic liquids, well, um, what are ionic liquids? Essentially, ionic liquids are, are just solvent systems, um, and the solvents, rather than use water or, or aqueous solvents, these, these are based on essentially low melting point um, salts. Um, so things like sodium chloride, for example, melt, melt about 800 and so Celsius, so no use for um, processing. Um, but organic salts, similar to the ones that you see here on, on the right-hand side of the slide, um, can have melting points well below 100 Celsius and often at room temperature. And it turns out that these types of, of liquid salts have very unusual and, and often very interesting properties. So they include things like very low vapor pressure, um, good thermal stability, so you can do high temperature processing without worrying about pressure containment and so on. Um, they have very good electrical conductivity, and that interests us as electric chemists. Um, and also access to electrochemical processes that we can't get in water and often organic solvents. So we can process reactive metals often in these types of liquids. Um, so they're very interesting, um, but from the point of view of, of, of processing, um, they're very expensive, and that, that's a, a challenge. So one of our focus uh, areas, really, in, in Leicester, is the development of, of liquid media that have the properties of ionic liquids but um, are much less uh, expensive and therefore more practical. And these we, we call deep eutectics. So essentially they're a mixture of, of two types of things and one of the most common examples is uh, a material which we call ethylene. And ethylene is its commercial uh, trade name. And essentially it's a, a two to one mixture of a material of a quaternary ammonium salt this is choline chloride and ethylene glycol. So you might recognize ethylene glycol as being the principal component of antifreeze. And choline chloride is a bulk commodity chemical uh, which is most often used in animal, um, animal feeds. Um, so mixing these two uh, materials gives us a, a, a liquid which has very similar properties to ionic liquids um, but which has relatively low impact environmentally uh, and is relatively cheap in terms of its bulk chemical cost. But we maintain those, those unusual solvent properties. And this graphic here that you see um, really is just indicating that actually how you formulate these types of, of, of solvents, how you, how you uh, make them from their components, gives you um, different colors for, for different metals which are dissolved in. So that tells us something about the fact that the chemistry of the metal ions dissolved in these materials is different depending on how you make them. So that offers us the opportunity to tune these liquids to do specific tasks. Well, within the, the context of, of metal finishing and, and electronics, um, we've, we're active in a range of different areas, and that really this is not to, to focus on any of those, just to give you a feeling for um, the, the, uh, the diversity in which these types of materials, these solvents, are being um, investigated. Um, so focusing on electric, uh, materials and metal finishing, we, we're active in, in many aspects of electric plating. So metals like nickel, gold, copper, um, aluminium, um, and alloys of those materials, chromium as well. Um, electro polishing, so if you can electroplate, then you can dissolve away. And so um, this graphic here shows you some stainless steel which has been electro polished using these types of liquids. And we work very closely with a number of industries, including aerospace. To, um, to develop those technologies. And most relevant here, really, are the immersion coatings. And of course, I'll, I'll talk more in more detail about that in a moment. But also in areas of metal recycling, so recovery of, of metals from, for example, PCB waste, uh, but also from mineral waste and, and, um, and uh, um, metal finishing waste, things like uh, sludge from plating and also materials ground up from waste batteries. Um, but also in the, in the development and emergence of new battery cell chemistry. So all of these different areas, um, we're, we're looking at the application of these types of new um, solvent technologies. Okay, well, uh, I want to talk specifically about um, the, these solvents in, in electronics and electronic finishes. And here we've, there are two real applications areas. Uh, one is in immersion coatings, and that's the main focus of this seminar, really. Um, where we've, we've, we've looked at particularly immersion silver and then latterly electrolysis, uh, well, immersion 
uh, coatings of gold on, on a lateralist nickel, um, where we've tried to uh, mitigate some of the issues uh, associated with problems like black pad and so on. Um, and also in the development of new, sol uh, new solar fluxes. And the images that you see on the screen here are really just there to, um, to kind of flag up the fact that we're not really just um, sort of ivory tower academics here uh, pursuing our own um, uh, interests. Um, these images are, are from um, test data that we've acquired with industrial and, and commercial partners. So, for example, the catapult at MTC. Uh, whoops. Um, and so that we're, we're kind of going down the route of wanting to get uh, industry validation and testing in order to, to show that, you know, actually these processes are, are real alternatives to current, um, current processes. Okay. Um, so PCB finishes, well, we, we, all, we all know really uh, what's on the slides. So I'll be quite brief. We, we know that we need to protect the uh, copper tracks on PCB uh, assemblies uh, in order to minimize oxidation because that oxidation reduces solderability and causes all sorts of other problems. Um, there are also a range of surface finishes. Uh, I've talked already about immersion silver, tin, we've got OSP, and one of the most commonly used is, is ENIG. Um, and then emerging, really, we have, because of problems associated with the Enig black pad and so on, we've got new candidates um, like Enig pig, so we have electrolyst nickel, uh, electrolyst palladium, uh, immersion gold. But, of course, we know that the, the, the maintenance of particularly electrolyst autocatalytic processes is often um, very time-consuming, very, you know, very, very um, detailed process. Um, and so what we were hoping to do um, was to uh, develop a, an alternative to these types of uh, surface finishes that involved less toxic materials, so cutting out the use of, for example, cyanides in gold chemistry, um, but also minimizing and simplifying process parameters and process chemistry. And we first started doing that by looking at immersion silver. Um, and here, immersion silver, the, the, the challenge for us, this is a few years old now, but it, it shows a pilot plant here that we built with a, co a company locally. Um, 12 tanks, um, about 1,000 litres or so of, 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 of deep eutectic solvent in here. Um, and the challenge here was to um, overcome problems that were associated with existing immersion silver coatings from nitric acid solutions where the, the competitive etching of the copper tracks caused by the nitric acid uh, was leading to failures, particularly with small feature sizes. So again, this slide is really in, in given to, to show you a little bit of the, the, the provenance of these types of liquids and the fact that we are, you know, been active in, in scale-up as well as just in the um, development, the academic development. Here there's one or two SEMs of um, through holes that have been soldered showing a nice, nice um, uh, adherence and so on. So that was for immersion silver. And then, latterly, we, we've just finished uh, an EU-funded project called uh, ASPIS. Um, and ASPIS was, again, focused on a particular challenge in the surface finishing. So this was to do with uh, electrolyst nickel emotion uh, gold. And, and the challenge with, with ENIG is that there's this process, black pad, which emerges. It's difficult to predict. The consequences can be severe if you have boards with black pad. Um, so the project ASPIS was aimed at First of all, trying to understand and, and um, diagnose black pad in, in boards. Um, and second, for us to develop perhaps an alternative to the ENIG that, that would never suffer from this type of problem. Um, so that was our role, and, and to a large extent we did that. Um, you see here some, some um, copper tokens. These are um, immersion gold coatings on, on existing um, commercial electrolyst nickel. And you see that using different types of gold salt in the deep eutectics, gold chloride, gold cyanide, and gold cyanoborate, we end up with very different finishes. Um, but we were able to show at the end of this project that we had an alternative um, to ENIG using um, this type of, of, of um, solvent technology. Um, I'll, I'll talk, I don't want to go on for too long, but I will talk very briefly about solar paste. So this is an applications area which has uh, developed fairly recently um, because it turns out that deep eutectic solvents also uh, function really well as solar fluxes, and that's partly because the metal oxides that occur on surfaces are very soluble in these systems. And so we've been active very recently in developing uh, and testing 
um, solder uh, flux technologies, including pastes for um, pick and place, uh, screen printing, pick and place assembly. And we've done quite a lot of testing with uh, MTC on their um, pilot lines um, to, to validate and to understand how these, these um, pastes work. And, and the, the message that I want to send to you on this occasion is that actually they work really well. They're really consistent. Um, we, we don't have the sort of supply and consistency issues that sometimes exist with um, rosin-based fluxes and, and so on. And, and they're, they're, the materials from which they are formulated are a good deal less aggressive and, and toxic than some of the commercial um, alternatives at the moment. So flux paste and solder technologies, uh, solder flux technologies is, is an area where we're currently quite active. And Andy uh, sat here with me, has developed and we've patented uh, an alternative surface finish which we've called Haslen. And Haslen is essentially very, very simple. Uh, because one of the, the, the benefits of these uh, deep eutectic solvent fluxes is that they can solder to and wet a, a, a greater number of substrates, and including electrolytes nickel. So normally you wouldn't be able to flux and solder directly to electrolytes nickel. Um, these solder fluxes can achieve that. Um, and here are some technical data. Here you can see a section through uh, copper, electrolytes nickel, and then um, solder directly onto electrolytes nickel using these fluxes. And we were able to show, for example, that uh, intermetallic growth is greatly sh slowed in these systems compared to existing hassle finishes. And we published um, some of that work recently in uh, the ICE, that's not the ICT journal, uh, in a, 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 an industry journal to try and highlight that. So, um, so these are where these kinds of technologies are going with, with the, um, the, the solar flux. And of course, the, the potential benefit here is that if we can have a finish which is directly soluble, a, a solderable, sorry, um, such as Haslen, then the, the question then is, well, do you need these existing processes, these existing follow-on steps like gold and so on? Um, so this is an area where we're currently um, active. Um, but I want to spend the last um, five or six minutes of, of this presentation um, talking specifically about the MacFest work. So here we were looking to develop um, a technology to rival really the existing uh, nickel palladium gold type finish. Um, we want a, 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 a finish which is able to withstand both soldering, reflow soldering and, and, and wire bonding. Uh, we need high reliability, good planarity for pick and place type um, and wire bonding assembly systems. Um, and deep eutectics give us the, the opportunity to do that to improve functionality um, and also to reduce the, the, the level of, of toxic chemicals so that we can do it without the use of gold cyanide, for example, and reduce the complexity associated with maintenance of, of, of immersion, of catalytic um, electrolyst palladium process. So in MacFest, we're looking at um, using an existing commercial electrolyst nickel substrate, but going on to that with an immersion palladium coating followed by an immersion gold coating. And of course, we're mindful of IPC standards and so on. Um, and uh, what I'm telling you now is, is that we're at the end of, in month 23 of a 24 month project, and actually it's gone really, really well. So I'm gonna show you some data, um, some, microscopic, some microscopy and, and some solder finishes, and then Tom will follow that up with some of the uh, quantitative test data. Um, so I mentioned already we used a commercial uh, electrolyst nickel substrate, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel in order to improve the process. So this is Dow SMT88. You see some S SEM images here on the right-hand side. Here is our electrolyst nickel substrate. Um, and the, the electrochemistry, the thermodynamics, if you like, are favorable for a nickel-palladium exchange. Um, so we can do that um, in, a, in a deep eutectic solvent using palladium chloride um, at 80 degrees for about 20 minutes and we get between 70 and 100 nanometers of palladium on that surface. And here you can see there's very little difference in the morphology. These are the grain nodules of, of the uh, electrolyst nickel. Um, but it looks slightly less clear in this image than here, and that's because we've filled in some of these um, uh, features with the immersion um, palladium. If you look optically at the tokens, of course, there's very little optical contrast between uh, the electrolyst nickel and the palladium, but you, that in a sense is good because it tells us that it's an even um, and uh, planar um, uniform coating. 
So simply immersing the, the, the electrolysis nickel in our solution of palladium chloride gives us um, the, uh, the thickness of palladium that we then require in order to do the subsequent coating, which is immersion gold. So we take those tokens, we then immerse them in another deep eutectic solution, this time containing gold salts, um, and we've done a lot of work looking at different types of gold salt. salt. So what I want to point out here is that neither of these contains cyanide. Um, so we can do the immersion gold coating from gold chloride or from um, sodium gold thiosulfate. Um, a, a further 9 to 15 minutes of process time at around about 50 degrees for the gold, gold coating gives us bright uniform um, gold coating. Here's a, a photograph of a, a, a trial token. Um, and the, the coating is uniform across different, different feature sizes uh, and through holes and we get good uh, surface coverage. So again, here's an SEM. Uh, again, it doesn't show much in the way of features, but that in a sense is good um, because it shows we're not getting um, an even coating, we're getting a nice even um, exchange process between the palladium and the gold. And once again, I should point out that these finishes are achieved in these, these ionic liquids, these deep eutectic solvents, in an acid-free and cyanide-free um, immersion plating environment. Um, okay, well, we did want to know a little bit about what the nickel substrate looks like after you've um, done these processes because one of the, the, the challenges with ENIG is that occasionally you get corrosion of the, of the nickel substrate caused by the um, conditions required for, um, um, for the gold. Um, so we took our, our ENI pig, so electrolysis nickel immersion palladium immersion gold finish, which I'm indicating here, and then using a commercial um, stripping um, solution, we stripped back the, both the palladium and the gold and then looked to see what, what the nickel substrate looked like underneath. And the good news there was that uh, it looks essentially feature free, so no sign of this mud cracking which I'm just indicating here. This is an image of mud cracking which you sometimes see in poor enig finishes caused by this kind of corrosion at the, the nodule boundary. So we saw no sign of that. Um, and uh, which is good news. So in other words, our substrate is not uh, unevenly corroded or in, in any way by these uh, immersion processes. We did also some uh, recently some fib milling. So fib milling uh, is a process where you, uh, you it's, it's a sectioning process, but unlike conventional section, sectioning where you cut and grind and potentially smear the layers that you're most interested in, fib milling is a process where we can um, cut away a, a part of the, of the coating um, using a, a much more controlled um, iron beam milling process and then uh, examine that section. So here this image shows a trench which has been cut into the uh, Eni pig uh, coating and then uh, if we look at a, at a more high resolution part of that, high magnification part of that in this image here, uh, we can see how, this is our nickel, electrolysis nickel phosphorus um, substrate here. Um, ignore this, this gray layer here is a protective layer of platinum required by the, the fib milling process, but you can see this is the layer of gold palladium which forms a very nice even coated, even thickness adherent um, layer across the top of our electrolysis nickel. So the, the message there and the, the important part of this is that if we do this type of fib sectioning we see very good um, coating, no sign of, of intergrain attack um, by the, the um, palladium or the gold on the, on the nickel substrate. So thin uniform gold palladium, uh, no evidence of grain boundary attack. So these are the, the key messages. Um, and then Tom is going to talk later in a few minutes, uh, unconscious of time, um, to tell you about the solder wetting balance uh, results, so I'm not going to dwell on that here. This, this slide is just really to indicate that we have done that. Um, and again, the, the wetting balance really um, shows that the, um, the deep eutectic solvent finish, the, the uh, immersion palladium, immersion gold, gives us very good wetting times, gives us very good wetting forces, and shows even uh, solderability. Um, and that message is again uh, backed up when we do solubility tests on, on um, tokens here, so here you can see where the solder has run up the pads of the token. If we section those, once again, we see the copper substrate, we see a nice uh, uh, layer of um, 
the uh, electrolyst nickel, and then on top of that, a really well bonded, well um, adhered um, solder finish. So no evidence of avoiding in this context, and no en evidence of any uh, grain attack. So the, the commercial, the, 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 the evaluation of the solderability here was done using um, SAT 305 and a, and a commercial water soluble flux supplied to us by um, by Qualitech. Okay, so, so my part of this really is drawn, uh, drawing to a close. Um, so I just want to summarize very briefly. Um, I, I hope that I've shown you that the, the, the behavior of these types of deep eutectic solvents is in, in many ways unique and, and certainly varied, offering um, quite a few opportunities within not only electronic finishes, but particularly in materials processing, materials finishing. Um, I've discussed with you very briefly um, some aspects of the applications of these types of solvent media on, on PCB finishes and, and solder pastes. And within the MacFest project itself, um, we've, we've looked at um, the immersion, oops, sorry, the, the immersion coating of um, palladium and then subsequently gold onto commercial electrolyst nickel. And, and uh, hopefully I've shown you that we can get really good, um, uniform, well-adhered um, coatings that are free from any strong acids, free from cyanides, and, and importantly, free from many of the technical uh, and maintenance constraints that, that go along with uh, autocatalytic um, electrolysis processes. So that's it for me, really. I need to just acknowledge a few people. So these are members of the group here in, in Leicester, most, most obviously Andy Ballantyne, who's sadly leaving us um, to uh, pass this new at Imperial uh, College. Um, and, a, and a few others there, some of my uh, academic colleagues. And uh, here you are, just a, a photograph of, of the group as it was a few months ago. Um, so that concludes my presentation now. Um, we'll be very happy to take questions later. Um, and I will hand back to Bob now, who, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Carl. And uh, I must say, I enjoyed my time uh, messing around with Andrew with uh, one of your previous projects and uh, reflowing paste and dipping samples uh, and certainly uh, the solderability and wettability of uh, your previous project materials was uh, very effective. Okay, thank you very much. We'll take questions of uh, Carl and Andrew a little bit later on, but it's now my pleasure to introduce um, Tom Jones. And uh, Tom is at uh, Merlin and um, Tom will be presenting some of the results of some of the tests that uh, he has been conducted. Uh, Tom, over to you, sir. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Bob. Um, yeah, so starting off, uh, Bob provided us uh, an opportunity to test the any pig finish, which we developed in solder wetting uh, uh, balance tests. So um, the uh, finish itself was benchmarked against uh, existing, surf uh, existing surface finishes and allowed us to uh, compare its performance. So first Bob provided us, a, provided us with a test board. Uh, this comprised of 18 test coupons uh, for solder spot, uh, spot and wetting balance measurements. So the individual coupon contains six tracks uh, which would have placed 22 solder spots and uh, seven pads here for wetting balance measurement. So we took this board and it was plated at Leicester University with the NI pig finish. So this is it on the uh, left hand side with its gold finish. Uh, and then I measured using X-ray fluorescence at Merlin the thickness of the deposit. So the we could, we've been aiming to uh, get metal finish with a thickness comparable to the IPC spec for NEPIG. So that is 3 to 6 microns of nickel, 50 to 150 nanometers of palladium, and above 25 nanometers of gold. So the results for the X-ray uh, results are here, and they show that for the nickel we, we got around 6 uh, microns, a little, bit, a little bit higher than the, the, the desired, but uh, nothing to worry about. Uh, the palladium measured here in uh, units of micron was around 80 nanometers so that's well within the uh, specification and the gold the, the smallest size we were measuring was around 30 nanometers up to 
80 nanometers. So that's well within uh, our requirements by IPC. So the boards look good from the initial outgo. Mm -hmm. So the wetting balance measurement test, uh, the samples themselves are uh, tested with the different manufacturing parameters which you might uh, receive in um, in assembly process. So they would go through, in, separately, they would go through a reflow oven, uh, they would go through vapor phase heating, which is separate, which is a separate process, and another test would be to reflow and then leave the board for a period of time. This occurs in, um, in component assembly and uh, where you get delays in manufacture and the boards are lying around for a while and you get oxidation on the board. So we wanted to test the performance with all those three conditions. So for the, for the wetting balance measurement, uh, solder flux uh, is applied to the pads themselves mm -hmm. and then uh, the pads are then uh, applied in a, into, a, into the solder. So on this slide here, there's a little video provided by Bob of how they perform. So here you can see the solder blob here, which is being brought up onto the sample, and it's uh, adhering to the test coupon, and as it pulls away, and what this is measuring is the force uh, induced by the amount of solder attached to the pad. And it's also measuring the time taken for the solder to adhere. So when you plot the force against the time, you obtain a curve like much like this. And uh, the, the response is effectively a rise where the solder is uh, adhering to the, the surface. And then a leveling off as no more solder uh, applies itself. And then uh, a drop off as the... Um, as it comes to an end. So we get a range of different curves uh, highlighting the different conditions which you may uh, achieve. So this uh, example here is of non-wetting, so that's where no solder is attached to the surface. Uh, an example of poor wetting where a little bit is attached. Uh, the desired outcome here is a good wetting mm -hmm. which is a, a gradual increase to, to a set value. Uh, a retarded wetting, uh, a slow wetting here where it never quite uh, it takes a very long time to, to, to adhere to the surface and various other ones. So the outcome we're looking for is this one highlighted here. So Bob provided us with the raw data for the tests. So we, as, as I mentioned before, we, we tested the wetting with no aging to the board. So this is without any reflow or, or vapor phase soldering uh, and we tested its wettability. So this is in its pristine condition and that's highlighted there. Uh, then we tested it after vapor phase soldering. So this vapor phase soldering is uh, typically applied to um, because it induces a, a uniform distribution of heat onto the uh, board which is uh, under reflow. So effectively all the components will receive an equal amount of heat. So that's, that's quite desirable in, in manufacturing. The, the other is a, a reflow oven. So that, that applies um, uh, heat uh, to, to, to the board, but suffers issues where um, some components might receive greater heat than others. Then there's the uh, convection with a hold period. So that's, as I mentioned before, there's, uh, there might be a delay in manufacture, so the boards are lying around and uh, due to oxidation, their, their, their performance would degrade. And uh, another example of holding the board, but this time after vapor phase soldering. So here's a plot provided for, by Bob of the, uh, of an example of what happened, of a, a degradation in quality uh, of um, wetting balance measurement when either the board is uh, heated or it's left for uh, mm -hmm. between reflow cycles. So on the left hand side we have a board which is um, uh, essentially pristine so it's, not, it's undergone no heating operations and we've got a, a curve which we typically uh, are looking for and then uh, if we were to induce a reflow on the board, heating it to, to, to a high temperature and then to try and uh, perform a um, soldering operation, we get a, a, a much poorer performance where it's uh, taking a lot longer to solder. So the first test, I've plotted the results here, and uh, this is for a, 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 a test coupon which has had no reflow or, or vapor phase or any hold. and um, 
we have the uh, electrolysis nickel uh, coating compared alongside our ionic liquid coating, and both perform uh, uh, perfectly fine, and that's what we'd be looking for. So taking that data, I then plotted two further graphs, one measuring the amount of solder applied to the board after a period of two seconds. So it's measuring the weight of the solder in, 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 in units of uh, millinewtons. And the second graph shows the time taken for the solder to wet to the surface. So effectively, what we're looking for is uh, a large force here. And we're looking for a quick time on this plot. And as I've highlighted our ionic liquid NIPIG finish, uh, it compares comparatively to all the other finishes uh, uh, which may be applied. So just to outline them a little, there's a copper OSP, which is an organic um, finish, uh, typically a cheap one, very desirable in the Far East where um, you, you can apply it to a, a board and it's, um, it comes at a very low cost. There's the electrolysis nickel immersion gold, there's tin, and, and hassle, and as I said before, it compares comparatively to them, and it has a relatively fast, quick uh, uh, time to wet. So the next plot shows the effects of uh, the board after one uh, reflow vapor phase soldering. So once again, we, we've shown the curve, and it appears to perform very well compared to um, yeah, it appears to perform very well. So the plots from that, once again, it shows a very high force. It compares very well compared to ANIG, and the time taken to wet is uh, quick compared to the other finishes, and even a, a little bit quicker than ANIG, although it's within its error range. Next shows the wetting balance measurement for one reflow. Once again, we've got a, a, a very nice curve, but there's a slight delay this time, so this is uh, uh, due, due to the higher temperatures. We've got some degradation in the board, as expected, um, but generally it's... Um, quite reliable, the results and repeatable. So these show different uh, repeats. And plotting the uh, force data again, we have, um, it's very comparable to the other finishes, and the time taken to uh, uh, to wet is also comparable, although in this case, any beat us in this time. So uh, previously, uh, Carl mentioned that that Leicester University had performed their own solder wetting balance, and this is the data from that. Uh, so we compared this time an NE pig finish as well, and ENIG, and our NI pig finish. And uh, once again, comparing wetting speed, uh, our finish performed uh, very well against the existing ones, so it's rather quick. So the next test that Bob performed was the uh, solder spot wetting test. So this is a test to determine how well uh, the solder will flow across the uh, uh, board. So it applies 22 paste dots to the tracks highlighted here. It uses a stencil, which I've highlighted here, and uh, solder paste will be pushed through and it will form a pattern much like the one in the bottom right hand corner. And uh, the board will be reflowed at uh, uh, the temperature and the dots here will coalesce and the what, what we're looking for is to count the amount of dots after reflow so this large section here will class as one dot and uh, effectively the smaller the amount of dots after after the test the better that the solder paste has flowed across the surface and uh, the uh, indicates the quality of the surface finish so here's a video provided by Bob of the process. So here we can see as the temperatures increase, the solder uh, dots are coalescing together. Okay. So Bob measured the uh, counted the uh, uh, the number of dots which had uh, coalesced and plotted the results against the different uh, fabrication conditions and for the different finishes. So the one we want to look at here is our finish, which is in the uh, light yellow color. So starting at the top here, this is typical convection, uh, uh, the number of dots produced comparing to the gold, which in this case is ENIC, it, before it, it produced uh, fewer dots, which suggests that uh, the, the reflow conditions were 
uh, a little bit better than the uh, uh, NIG. So this is the, the next one is convection and hold. So the performance of the board is degraded, so therefore um, you get more dots on the surface compared to just convection. And uh, once again, our our finish seems to have performed uh, uh, better than the ENIC. Uh, the next test is reflow nitrogen. So nitrogen uh, is typically applied in in the in the reflow process uh, because it's um, it's cheaper for one thing, and also it's the uh, oxidation occurs at a slower rate, so, so it enables a bit more control with the with the operator. And uh, once again, the uh, our process performed rather well compared to ENIC. And uh, the same trend follows the vapor phase and a vapor phase with a hold. Uh, a clean reflow here, that, that's where uh, we were performing either a, sli a slight bit uh, behind the standard gold process, but uh, compared to the rest, um, it performed very well. Mm -hmm. So, a brief summary. The uh, ionic liquid performed well in terms of sol in soldering force and its wetting speed. And the wetting test highlighted that the uh, it was comparable and in some cases better than ENIG after different processing conditions. So, what's next for the MACFest? So, one of the components, which, one of the factors which makes this a universal finish is that um, uh, this finish can also be wire pull test, uh, wire, wire bonded. And uh, so what we're looking to do is to get the uh, finish wire bonded and then to test the strength of the bond and in the forms of a wire pull test and a ball shear test. So I'm just going to discuss a little bit uh, about what those tests in entail. So this is effectively what we'll be looking for. we we'll look for a forwards looping process where it's a ball and stitch bond. And here's a, a quick video of the, the process in action. I uh, didn't realize there was music to it. So here we have two uh, gold pads and uh, the gold wires getting bonded. Here we have an example uh, where the integrated circuit is being bonded to the PCB. So this is for um, high data and um, small interconnect feature applications. Uh, this is an example of the test, one of the tests which will uh, induce on the bonds. So it, it's to tug on the wires with a, uh, a hook and measure the pressure induced and uh, get a characteristic of the metal's performance. So here we see the hook pulling on the wire and it pulls it to a breaking point, which is soon. There we go. The next test is ball shear testing. So this is testing the uh, ball component of the uh, wire bond and how well it's uh, uh, bonded to the surface. So here the nib pushes the ball like so and uh, from the pressure induced you get a characteristic of the uh, metal's behavior and you can compare with existing tests and use it as a benchmark. So we've designed some test boards for these uh, uh, for this setup. So we're looking to get uh, gold wire bonding formed and aluminium wedge wire bonding and ideally copper wire bonding which is um, up and coming uh, and we'll test the wire pull and ball shearing where we can. Of course we won't do that for aluminium wedge wire bonding because the, the bond doesn't have a ball for that. And also we'll test the different pad sizes uh, because there is uh, you get a variation in behavior based on the size of the feature. So here's a quick overview of my design and a close-up. So here we have the different feature sizes and where wire bonding will occur between. So we're currently working on that now. The boards are in manufacture and uh, once they're made we'll get the finish plated onto that. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'd like to hand over to Bob now and if, if you have any questions please ask. Well thank you very much. Uh, yes I'll just take uh, back uh, control of the, uh, the screen. And uh, as we previously said, if you've got any questions, all you need to do is type them directly in the control panel. And uh, both uh, Tom and Carl and Andrew will be pleased to know there are quite a few questions already, so you're not getting off uh, uh, too lightly. And just to clarify, <laughs> just to clarify, the tests that uh, Tom was referring to uh, were all done um, in what well, the assembly process, not uh, and the testing was done uh, at an exhibition in Sweden in September, 
uh, basically when I set up production facilities and run production lines, I like to do something constructive because sitting around for uh, two or three days doing nothing, watching <laughs> machines go up and down, uh, I like to do something constructive and that's why I invited the opportunity of producing some boards for me to play with. So that, that's sort of like the, the real story behind the scientific okay. experiment. So um, if you guys are ready to go, let me just uh, pick up some questions. So first question is from Mark. How do you control the gold chemistry in the DES process? Uh, how do you know it is gold? What is the redox chemistry of gold in DES? Mm -hmm. I assume it's a question for Mark or Andrew. Um, can you, can, you can hear us? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, I don't know. I'll take one of those. I can take one. Is that, so what was there was three questions there, really, weren't there? How do we control well, chemistry? Let me, read, let me read it out again. How do you control yeah. the gold chemistry in the desk process? How do yeah. you know it is gold? And what is the redox chemistry of gold in desk? Okay. Um, so... Uh, the redox chemistry of gold in the deep eutectic is um, something which we obviously spent quite a long time looking at. So we would we um, have used techniques such as cyclic voltammetry to quantify the redox potential, um, look at the uh, the kinetics of, of both reduction and um, dissolution of gold. Um, the the potential is is quite. Uh, is positive, but I mean the balance of potentials, which I imagine is probably what's behind this question, is such that you get um, exchange between the gold and the palladium. So, um, so the, the 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 order of the redox potentials of nickel, palladium, and gold is is appropriate to allow the thermodynamics to take over. So, um, you couldn't if the, if the redox potentials weren't right, you couldn't do it that way. Um, but we have looked at and measured the, the redox potentials of both palladium and gold and, and nickel in order to establish <coughs> excuse me, um, that those are in the correct order uh, in order to allow that, that thermodynamic exchange process to occur. So I think that, I think that sort of addresses what, what is the redox chemistry of gold. Um, Andy, do you wanna, how, do we, how do we know it's gold on the surface? Do you want to answer that? Uh, so... By analysing, we do various uh, things to analyse the surface. So at the University of Leicester, we've been doing uh, SEM and EDAX to, and looking at the relative atomic ratios uh, that we get in the EDAX. And so you can get, rather than getting a, a quantitative judgment, you can get an idea of relative amounts of uh, gold and palladium and nickel on the surface. But then also at, uh, at Maryland, Tom, Tom has been running uh, some... Uh, X-ray fluorescence for us, so XRF measurements looking at uh, the, the actual thicknesses of the palladium and the gold as well. And we found that they, they stay fairly consistent uh, and, and are well within the, the specifications of, of the IPC spec. Just to interject, we've also had uh, the um, XRFs benchmarked at, an, at another company as well with their own XRF device, and uh, so uh, it, it's highlighted, it highlights that... Uh, it's gold on the surface. And in terms of maintaining the chemistry, so just like any any typical immersion process, you will get a gradual build up of 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 your what your um, of your substrate material as you as you're depositing the gold and you're oxidizing the substrate. So that would happen in an EA process. So that's what's going to happen in our palladium and the gold processes. And one of the companies, uh, CTEC Innovation, that was involved in the project. Has been, they've been studying this. So what happens uh, to the plating rate as you as you try to increase the metal turnovers, uh, and also yeah, what happens to the coating quality as well. So um, so that research is currently ongoing, but I think preliminary results show that we are able to kind of increase the number of of plating turnover rates. How far we can push it is um, that's still we're still investigating that at this moment. But we can. We've developed systems to monitor concentrations as well. So we've been using uh, UV um, analysis to look at uh, concentration and uh, some titration measurements, uh, as well as as well as um, 
uh, using something called uh, ICP for looking at uh, as a, as, so you've got two complementary methods for looking at metal concentrations. We've also used uh, atomic absorption spectroscopy on the solutions to identify the uh, gold concentrations. Okay, next question. This is from Norbert, and this is a question specifically to Carl. Uh, what do you use as a rinse chemical in your plating process? Is it water or is it uh, ethylene? Um, so, um, okay, so, so we, we do both, and it depends upon w which particular bath is being used. Um, so generally, we would have uh, a separate um, deep eutectic rinse associated with a process, and that's really just to, to manage the, the drag out and, and um, to not end up with a lot of effluent and waste. Um, and also, the, one, one issue that we have with deep eutectics is that they are... Uh, a little bit more viscous than um, some of the comparable technologies that we're kind of up against. Um, so potentially drag out is, is an issue. Um, so what we what we and what we've done with with the nickel uh, immersion gold immersion plate immersion gold is is to rinse separately in in DS, in DS first, um, and then where necessary to rinse with water. Um, it, it, just to take that back a step, when we were Developing the uh, immersion silver, one of the um, the uh, features of that process was that we were using silver chloride rather than silver cyanide um, or silver nitrate. And in silver chloride, obviously that's that's highly insoluble in any aqueous rinse. So in that particular case, it was necessary to do uh, a, a, at least two separate rinses um, in in the deep eutectics. So that that there was a, a, a bigger overhead, if you like, in terms of rinse. Um, with that particular process, but we don't have that problem with the um, the nickel and gold processes. So the short answer is you do a, a rinse in, in deep eutectic, a deep eutectic, and then you do a rinse, uh, an aqueous rinse after that. But it's it is also fair to say that. Um you know, when you start to go into production and sort of uh, are making higher volumes, you know, the process may change subtly because you, th there are things you don't know until you actually do it for real in a real production environment. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, also? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I think one thing we should point out, I mean, and it's, it's one thing to to be able to demonstrate technology. It's one thing to be able to say it works and, and to, to quantify the finish and to, to produce very positive results, which is what I think we've done. But I think we need to also acknowledge that it is a fairly young technology um, and that, uh, you know, if you look at any, any aqueous process, any aqueous process, it has a legacy of, of you know, probably at least 100 years of of operation and, and understanding about life cycle and, and uh, maintenance issues, um, sometimes more than that, you know, sometimes less. But in other words, a lot of, of, of anecdotal experience is already packaged up in, in many of the existing commercial processes. We we don't have that, you know. We, we've we've we're a new technology, so that's where we're trying to catch up. Um, what what we're trying to show really is that actually there is real technical value in some of these processes. But that you know, one of the th one of the ways to take that forward is not just to show that there's there's functional equivalence and functional improvements, but also to be able to understand these life cycle and bath maintenance and process issues. Yeah, I, I fully understand that. Uh, being involved with the silver processes at the start, uh, I know it only too well. Okay, next question. This is from Mitter. Uh, how about cost of uh, the coating? Any studies done? Comparative costs. I know that you said that uh, when you initially started, the costs could be high, and then obviously by refining the process, you could improve the cost. But is a sort of you know, can can you give numbers on it at all? Um. <laughs> again, it, okay. So I can give some some bulk numbers. So it's difficult to to talk about the numbers in terms of board boards, um, but in terms of the, the materials themselves. Um, the, the, the deep detector that we're using um, we, has a, probably a bulk chemical cost. Um, it changes quite a lot, but at the moment it's, it's probably about about six pounds, or maybe 
around about that. That's probably a bit of an overestimate. Probably say five five pounds per kilo. Um, so it's more than you know an aqueous solvent, obviously. Um, but then you know we the, the gold salts that we've sourced are are typically less expensive. Um, so gold chloride, for example, is, is less expensive than um, uh, gold cyanide. Uh, that's obviously the the, the environmental uh, advantage of that. Um, and the other thing is, is that you know, there's, there's, because of the, the functional improvements, there's the opportunity to reduce the amount of, of gold which is actually being put down. Um, so there, again, the, the, the economic model is, is a bit difficult to to finalise or, or to develop really to any <laughs> to any useful extent because knowing those costs and those those process variables depends hugely on on volume and, and how they're managed. Um, so it sounds like I'm sort of fudging that, but it's 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 difficult to know and, and until you know until you understand the the the, the reproducibility, the the length of a, a bath life, um, and all those other things, um, and and sometimes just the bulk costs really can can mask the benefit, the economic benefits of those other aspects. So that's pretty much what I know at the moment. Okay, well, moving. Uh... Just another question from Mark. Um, what happens if you try using AU2, or sorry, AU3 chloride instead of AU1 chloride? Okay, yes, I'll answer this one. So we've not we've not used AU3 in this process. We've done uh, during the ASMIS project. We looked at using AU3. So one of the one of the negative aspects of doing that is that because we because an immersion coating process is inherently corrosive, you are it's exchanging your substrate with uh, whatever your metal is in solution. If you have AU3, that means that you need uh, essentially you need more of your substrate to exchange with the, with the metal uh, in solution to get to get the same amount of coating across the surface. So that was uh, that proved to uh, it seemed to be more negative aspects associated with having. Um, using AU3 and that you got more attack of the, the nickel and asbestos project. So, uh, so in this here we exclusively focused on AU1, so AU1 chloride. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, question uh, more from the assembly side now from Pat. Uh, does this new uh, PCB finish offer any benefits for improvement of voiding levels in the finished products? Have you investigated that in any way? Do you want to take that on, Tom, or is, I mean... Uh, my thoughts were actually, uh, Andrew had done some uh, investigations looking at uh, the uh, growth on the grain boundaries when uh, he mentioned it a few slides pr prior uh, in his presentation, and um, uh, effectively it showed that uh, the, the, the mud cracking effect on the nickel wasn't present, and um, uh, the, the, the issues of... Um, uh, uh, the, the black pad and uh, prevented, and uh, the, the same. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's uh, apparent in the in the NI pig as well that um, uh, the poor issues uh, such as attack down the grain boundary don't occur for these. Um, so yeah, effectively we we obtained a, a high performance with that. Um, so, in, so in theory um, now. Obviously, we're talking about slightly different things, voids and um, you know black pad. Yeah. But if you think about the surface, if you've got, uh, let's say, you know, very good solderability, but uh, at certain points on the surface, like with um, uh, uh, the nickel corrosion or the corrosion at the, at the boundaries, you've got some interfacial voids forming. If you don't have the problem to start off with, if you've you've proved which your SEMs illustrate then in theory there's no sites to see you know a lack of wetting in very small point areas so you wouldn't mm. get any interfacial bond any interfacial voids i would have thought yeah but if, well, thank you bob for explaining that a bit more yeah effectively we um we need to do more uh, trials looking at a higher volume of uh, board throughput and uh, testing on a wider range of features uh, all of this falls a bit outside of the funding of the project, but uh, hopefully through a next round of funding after this, we'll be able to look more in depth and uh, identify all, all those issues to overcome. If I, if I can just add to that, um, 
I think it, it, it absolutely is. This is one issue that we, we want. I mean, it, we've talked about a few tests, really, but these are just the beginning. So when I was talking about the solar flux uh, testing that we did at, MT, at MTC, uh, Manufacturing Technology Center in Coventry, um, essentially what we were able to do there is, is, is assemble test boards um, using pick and place and reflow, and then look using their X-ray tomography methodologies to be able to look look in the the, the solar joints and the, and the solar balls, and there, of course, you, you can see some voiding, which is due to the flux. Um, but what we would like to do, uh, and as Tom has said, really, it falls beyond the the scope of this project now. But what we'd like to do is to take those kind of testing methodologies further, and look at those exactly that methodology using this finish to see if there is any interfacial voiding. Um, but certainly in the, in the very limited tests that we've done um, on solubility and sectioning, um, there's really no evidence on, on the scale that we've looked um, for um, interfacial voiding. Well, one of the techniques that I've uh, used, but unfortunately not in Europe because the equipment doesn't uh, have CE approval, um, we've looked at uh, reflow of area array, uh, LGI type components um, to look at voiding, but uh, reflowing in X-ray, so you're examining the results of the reflow process while it's actually happening. And this might be a technique that uh, might be very interesting to utilize uh, to see if there is a, a benefit or an extra benefit um, with your finish in the future. Mm. That does sound interesting. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, it's always new things I like to play play with. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them directly into the control panel, and uh, the team will do their best to answer them for you. Uh, There's another question from Mark. Have you been able to measure the activity coefficient for uh, PB2 and other species in DES? This would be very interesting. Um, so, okay, the short answer to that is no. Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Well, we've not. We've not measured the um, activity of lead. Certainly, um, we've done some lead electrochemistry. Um, it, there, we, we've done. We actually have published work in, on on uh, the behaviour of, of metal ions in in deep eutectics, and in particular how that varies with concentration. So I think that's what Mark is getting at. Um, and it turns out that many of these uh, metal ions behave really very well. In, in, in thermodynamic terms, they behave I or close to ideally. Um, so the, 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 the kind of message behind that question is, although we I don't think we've mentioned it directly for, uh, for lead, but the activity coefficients for, for many of these metals, including gold, silver, copper, um, the so-called well-behaved metals, um, their activity coefficients are pretty close to one. Um, so I think if Mark is listening now, then we published uh, it's a while ago now. It was a couple of years ago on on an ideal behaviour of um, metal ions in deep eutectic solvents. So if, I can probably send that paper um, if he if he emails me. Well, uh, you'll receive a copy of um, the, all the questions at the end of the, uh, the webinar. You guys will receive those because uh, Mark has also asked for a, a reference on the Haslem paper as well. So you'll be able to send that to him. So again, yeah, uh, no, you'll, be able to, uh, you'll be able to send those uh, uh, to him. Yeah, the Haslem paper was in PCB magazine, so I can easily send a, a PDF of, of that. Yeah. And it's open access as well, so you can you can view it online. So, uh, just a final reminder: if you have any questions uh, for uh, any members of the team, if you'd like to uh, uh, just type them directly into the control panel. We have one more just come in, uh, and uh, I'll take one more if we get one more after this uh, one that's just come in, and uh, before we conclude. Um, the question is, what do you mean by ideally, this is Mark, uh, thought I typed PB, PB, not PB? Uh, I think we need to have a long, oh yeah, yeah, so there's probably an online thing you need to <laughs> have a discussion. Um, so I'll leave that for the time being. 
uh, Carl and uh, Andrew will see these questions, so obviously they can respond directly mm -hmm. to Mark. But uh, if you've got any more questions, please, uh, quickly, if you'd be kind enough to just type them into the control panel. While we're waiting for any final questions, can I just ask uh, Carl and also Tom, any final conclusions um, you'd like to uh, mention first, uh, Carl? Um, in addition to to what I've said already, uh, probably what I've done has covered it. I think I think I would just um, I would stress that my my view of these types of solvent technologies is a very positive one. But I, I understand, you know, the, the conservatism and, and the, the reluctance to adopt new technologies in, in many industries, in aerospace, in, in, in electronics manufacturing. So I think I would say to people that, you know, we are very, very conscious of, of issues of, of life cycle and, and use and maintenance. Um, and that that's something that we are, are active in trying to develop um, at the same time as, as kind of pushing forward the, the ideas and potential technical benefits of these types of systems. Okay. And Tom? Uh, from myself, uh, the t as mentioned before, the tests that we performed, there are only uh, really a few uh, of the uh, many different ones which will be required to really introduce this as, as a new finish uh, for PCB manufacturing. For example, we, we'd look to test uh, different material types uh, and, and the behavior there. Um, and even the wire bonding, um, uh, we'd look mm -hmm. to get uh, the, the gold and the aluminium and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully copper as well. Um, but uh, copper availability is uh, uh, slightly more difficult than um, those two. But just, just thinking of a, a quote I received on uh, got just the gold wire bonding from Verth. Uh, they, they quoted around uh, 8,000 euros, which is uh, a little bit beyond uh, our funding requirements right now. But um, uh, as I say, all the tests we perform to date are uh, they show a very good quality, and I feel confident that the ones go, the others going forward will show equal performance. Okay. So uh, on behalf of the uh, the project, uh, our presenters, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending this particular webinar. As I said, you will receive a copy of uh, each of the slides presented. You can, of course, uh, email each of the presenters uh, with any questions after this particular event. And if any of your colleagues were unable to uh, sit in on this presentation, a video recording uh, will shortly be available on the uh, MacFest website. But please give it a day. Uh, I have, I'm told it's going to be there today, but you know, give it a day, and you'll be able to relive. Uh, uh, the presentation. So once again, thank you for uh, participating. Thank you to uh, each of our presenters and hopefully you've benefited from being involved in this particular presentation. So um, it's just coming up to uh, uh, 20 to 11. So good morning.